But I'm just thinking this is kind of a cool dynamic to let people use their gifts in such a way where they just offer it up. And I have no idea what they're doing. Right? That's between them and God and, and what they want to create back there. But I want you to think about it started as a blank canvas. Or in my mom's case, in Carl's case, in a, it's a rock. It was a blank rock. And now they're creating something new. And I want you to think of that. When you came in through these doors this morning, when you're listening online to this, you entered this with a clean slate. Whether you agree with that or not, whether you want to say that or not, it's available to you. And then, what will you allow God to draw on your canvas? Will you be who He says you are, or will you start putting on your canvas all of your stuff? I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I can't do that, God. You cannot possibly use me knowing my past. Or will you accept the gift of grace through the cross? That because He paid a price, we have a blank slate. Anytime you want it. That's the beautiful news of, of this Gospel. At any time. And then you allow the Creator to come and do a work and put these things in play. And you start to live into that. That I'm a child of God. Lean into that. Start to live, live that out a little more. Take that on. Come a little more loving and kinder. Right? That's the, the blank slate. So we'll see how that progresses. I kind of asked them to be in the back so it wouldn't be distracted. But every now and then, if you want to take a peek, that's fine. All right? So let me transition into the teaching now. And Will, if you could put up the quote by Dallas Willard. Last week we talked about grace. I'm kind of doing transformation part two. And last week we talked about grace. And I want to just do a quick review because if you, if we can't miss this part of it. When we talk about transformation, if we forget about the connection part of God, the worship part, we talked about John 15.5. We talked about being connected to the vine, right? And that the, the branch is being connected and staying connected, and, and developing a rhythm in life that allows us to draw close to God and for Him to draw close to ourselves. But this quote, it says that grace is God's power. I don't know how many of you talk about that. Like We gave a lot of definitions last week. But grace is God's power bringing about what we cannot do on our own. I don't know how many of you ever equate grace with power. But it's like God enabling you, coming alongside you when you don't think you can make it. And somehow He sustains you. I a different picture of grace, but I really want you to get that because I'm going to put that grace with our effort. And that's how we realize transformation. Right? But it first starts with acknowledgement. That's why I started, when we started the music and the prayer was about gratitude. Right? If we have to kind of get out of ourselves and out of our heads and the stories that, we, that get in our way so that we can understand God's grace better. And then you're kind of going to be like this powerhouse because all of a sudden when you get this, you're teaming up with God of all creation. And His grace is enabling you and empowering you to take on that which you didn't think you could do on your own. Right? And so transformation, we talked about how hard it is for us to change our lives. Right? Take any area of your life. And I want you to be thinking about this. And even you can write it down on a piece of paper. You can write it on your phone. But somewhere in the next 45 minutes, think about what area in your life is not working as well as you'd want it to. It could be your, your marriage. It could be your relationships. It could be your friendships. It could be there's things in my nature. This I want to be more loving. I want to be more patient. I want to be less angry. I want to be less stressed. I want to get my finances in order. Like, it doesn't matter to me what it is, but be thinking of an area of your life where you're saying, it's not working as well as I want it to. And if I could get transformation in this area, it would make a huge difference. All right, so as I'm talking, I want you to think about that area and then say, okay, with God's grace and then my effort. We talked about the difference between effort and earning. Okay, so, but we have to do something. Keep putting one foot in front of the other as we trust God's grace. Okay, so that, yesterday, I thought this was just a beautiful picture. It was one of those things where it's like, man, I don't want to be there, right? Because it was a beautiful day yesterday. We've gotten like two in the last 48 days, right? So I felt like there was a thing on my schedule where it's like, I didn't have to be there. 
And some of you may remember David Scott who came here. David played some songs for us one time. He has a cleft lip palate. And he's had uh, 24 surgeries since birth. Keep working on that. And he's going to come back in June, I believe it is, to sing for us. But he had a little event in Providence. It was at a library on, off of Broad Street. And I was like, you know what? I gave him my word that I would be there. And so I set off and I went over there. And when I got there, you know those voices that get in your head? It's like, oh, there's only like 10 people here. It's so beautiful outside with Diane. Things. So many other things I could be doing, right? But then you're in that moment. And now you enter the room, and it doesn't really matter how many people are there. And I see David. And David, you can't help but he's got this contagious smile. He has a presence about him. And I've seen him transform his life. He used to be a very timid guy, and all of a sudden he's, he's just up there. And he starts sharing his story. It's on Facebook Live, too, if you want to check it out. So you can go and see it. So he's using his gift of music along with his story of what it was like. He started talking about how he felt shame. He wanted to avoid people. So much so that there was another girl in his class. It was a small school that he went to. And she was there too. He, he kind of enrolled her in this project. So she was going to speak later. Her name is Ellie. But he and Ellie went to school together. And he avoided her. And they started sharing. He said, you know why I avoided her? Because I was trying to avoid myself. I wrote a song called Beautiful. This idea that God. Beautiful. There was a woman, not there yesterday, but in our, in our other group that knows both of us. After he sang that song, she looked at him and said, can you say that you're beautiful? And it hit him like a ton of bricks. And I think for the first time in his life, he looked at her and said, yeah. Beautiful. See that? That's Transformation. Transformation happens when we trust God and we take a risk. And so here he is, and he starts singing his songs, and he shares his story. And I'm getting all emotional as I'm watching. So then Ellie comes up. She also had all these surgeries. So as a young lady, she starts talking about what it's like to be a young girl going through the school systems and being bullied and picked on. and awful. I kept saying it's hard enough for most of us when we go through those, those time periods, right? It's hard as children to go through those times, especially when you don't fit in. In her whole life, until she was 25 years old, she felt shame. And here she is standing before us. She's sharing confidence in front of a room. And so there's this exchange between David and Ellie. She starts saying how she wants to make a difference in the world. She wants a community for kids that are going through the same things that they went through so that they could hear her story. They, they could get the support. They get a lot of support from the medical field. But what they overlook is the emotional side of it. And so she goes, I want to bring that to this community. I want to help them deal with the emotional side of this. A side that don't, no one wants to see. I don't want to see myself. And how she as a young lady can speak into that. And he as a young man can speak into that. I kind of like, you know how I am. I like cry over anything. Like, <laughs> I start to speak and I'm like a blubbering mess. And I'm like, you guys. Like <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so inspired. And I was like, you know what? I was, the word courage, it couldn't come out of my mouth. Because I was overwhelmed. But I'm like, your courage. To do something about this is amazing. And that's what happens. When you get transformed, you step out and you all of a sudden have a spirit of courage in you because it's God's grace enabling you and empowering you. But, you, but if you don't step, it doesn't work. Do you get that? It's like God's grace is always there. It's always present and available. But it's like you've got to do something. And the transformation process starts when you take that step. When you take a step, you keep taking a step. 
And every time it's scary, and that's why there's courage in it. But my gosh, on the other side of that is free self-expression. On the other side of that is I can change a life. On the other side of that, it's not about me anymore and my defect. Now it's about, my gosh, I can affect another person's life for the positive. And you start living that life. That's a life of transformation. That's a life of value. That's a life worth living. And so everyone in this room, I want you to be thinking about that area that's not working as well as you want it to. All right. This is just the opening. Goodness gracious. So quick, quick review, okay? So we talked about grace is not opposed to effort, but earning. And then we did like, um, put up the triangle if it's on there, Will. We talked about like this picture of, of spiritual growth and transformation. And you have to have all three of these ingredients working together. The action of the Holy Spirit, along with the ordinary events of life. Right? Life is one of the greatest teachers because all the things I'm talking about are real life events that all of us go through. But sometimes we sign to think about as I'm going through this, we don't even see that that's about spiritual maturity and development. Right? As you go through something in life, God is always a teacher. He's always trying to take you through something. But are we willing to allow him to do so? And then the plan disciplines to put on a new heart, which I'm probably going to talk more about next week but this idea that there are practices and spiritual disciplines can that can really help us to realize transformation and then lastly we talked about vim right vim vision intentionality and means are the methods and that's what leads to transformation so you have to have a picture of mind that that's impactful to you like if you have this area in your mind right now you know this area that you want to work on now start putting a picture to it think about what it looks like a year from now if you could have anything you want in that area, what would it look like? What's the picture? What's the vision of that? And it's got to be something that is like, my gosh, this moves me. Because if it doesn't move you, guess what? You stay stuck. So it's got to be moving. And then the intention is like, now I'm going to have some disciplines. I'm going to put these things in line. I'm going to be intentional about taking the steps toward that picture, towards that vision. And then the means are just the different methodologies that you can use. There's tons of resources that we can all glean from that create your action steps. So that was Vim. All right, so with this, we're going to talk about a Bible reading from 2 Kings chapter 2 today. And Will's going to come up and, and do that. We have the microphone. Will, kind of come up here. Hello? To you, huh? Please stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. One day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord, they, said, they told him. This town is located in pleasant surroundings, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Elisha said, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water, and he threw the salt into it. And he said, this is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. And the waters remain pure ever since, just as Elisha said. Elisha, went, Elisha left Jericho and went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, a group of boys from the town began mocking and making fun of him. Go away, Baldy, they chanted. Go away, Baldy. Elisha turned around and looked at them, and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of them. From there, Elisha went to Mount Carmel and finally returned to Samaria. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Amen. You may be seated. So there's a reason why I asked Will to do the reading, because he doesn't like to. Get that? And he didn't even, like, push back when I asked him, which I thought that was pretty impressive. I didn't tell him I was going to do it. I just said, hey, did you do the reading this morning? <laughs> and I'm just thinking about all the things that go on in your head when that happens. Isn't God asking us to do stuff every single day? And we allow this thing to stop us over 
over it. I want you to really pay attention to the voice in your head. We're going to talk about it at length a little bit. But let me give you some background to this story. Elijah and Elisha. I want you to think about like two brothers, two teammates, two people that are passionate about living life for God. They were prophets, right? So they were to speak on God's behalf. Not an easy life to live. Right? And a lot of times when they're speaking, it's about confronting. I don't know about you, but that's never really a pleasant thing to do. To challenge people where they're at, to get them to move, which I'm doing this morning. And it will be uncomfortable, just so you know, if I haven't said that already. And I am going to be asking some of you, not just one of you, to stand up later, and I hope someone takes me up on it. We'll see. All right. Just so now all those things, all the thoughts going through your head, like some of you just got lower in your seats. You know, some of you like started moving, so if I sit in the second, third row, they can't see me, all right? Um, and so we have that voice going into my head, please don't pick me. You know where that started from? Probably in about second, third grade, where you are so anxious, right? Because little kids aren't, don't have inhibitions at first. They get trained, just like all of us as adults. They're like, whoa, pick me, pick me, because you think you have the answer right. And then that teacher picks on you and you said the wrong thing and everyone started laughing. And you're like, what did you do in that moment? You started saying, I'm not going to ever raise my hand again unless I'm 100% right. Like you have to absolutely know it. Or you know, I'm never going to be embarrassed again. So guess what? I'm just going to sit back and play it safe. Or whatever. Whatever you determine. But all of us made something happen out of that moment. And we're still living in it today. What happened when you were eight years old And however old you are right now, you're still living in that. Because we're human, so we do. But that's an opportunity for transformation. So here's Elijah and Elisha. And there's a trans, this is during Elijah is now going to be taken up to be with God. And this is like some scary stuff. And it's kind of sketchy when you read it because you're like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I'm thinking about both Elijah and kind of being like, what is going to happen here? Like this has never been done before. Right? You're going to be taken up and be with God, whatever that means. But then Elisha's sitting there going, but I got your back and I'm going to be with you. And it happens like three times where Elijah's going, I got to go on. And Elisha's like, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving your side. And it's kind of like to me, there was something about it that he's like, there's something here for, that God has for me. If I just stay with you, Elijah, there's something in me that I believe God is going to do. And so he kept going with him, kept going with him. So all of a sudden it comes to that moment and he gives him the cloak. And it's just a, just a passing, right? It's just saying like the spirit of God that was anointing on, on Elijah is now going to be passed to Elisha. All right? And so what I want you to see is all of a sudden Elisha is going from the minor leagues to the big leagues. Do you get that? Like all of a sudden there's no more Elijah. He's going up. He's not long, no longer on the scene And now here I am, and I am the voice of God to this people. Now all of a sudden, they're going to rely on me. I have this huge responsibility on my shoulders. And you have to feel the weight of that. And you got to put yourself into a situation where that's happened to you, and you go, oh my gosh, this is all new. What am I going to do here? Okay, so you see where it is. Now, the one point I really want you to get today is this. To realize transformation, you must break through resistance. To realize transformation, you must break through resistance. Because any time that you want to make a change in your life, there will be resistance. Guaranteed. You cannot think of a time in your life where God was trying to do something in you that it just happened. There was no resistance because you're human. So we're going to talk about our own resistance that we put on that. I was thinking about you, Jeremiah, so you'll see in a second. Yeah, I love this. He's like, what happened? So there's two, there's two, uh, there's two uh, resistance, okay? There's many more, but I'm going to just, the naysayers and the critics, right? Naysayers and critics, the people in your life that say, you can't do that, or you'll never be able to accomplish that, or whatever, right? So you got that. And then the other one is our own voices. So we're just going to talk about those two things. So when you go back to the scripture, it talks about one day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. 
seems like so innocent, doesn't it? Huh. The leaders are coming to meet with Elisha. This isn't just like the small little thing that's about to happen. One of the first challenges that Elisha embraces is this huge leadership issue. Anyone remember? What was going on here? Is it up there? <laughs> Anyone remember? We just, this was part of the, what we just read. What was the big issue? Water. Water was a huge issue. And because that was an issue, what was happening to the land? It was dying. It was unproductive. Unproductive. That means a society is at risk. Put yourself in that situation. <laughs> I thought, I was thinking like, uh, I never made it to the big leagues, but I played minor league baseball. But you, I, I'm always intrigued when I watch guys from the minors, they come up for their first game into the big leagues. Right? Because I can, you know, we've all had our first. So like the first time you played JV baseball, the first time you played varsity, the first time you went to college, the first time you, whatever those things are. And you're like, oh my gosh. And you got those butterflies. And you're nervous as anything. And then I'm watching, like, this just happened with the Red Sox. Who's the kid that came up and hit the, the, the second placeman? What is it? Michael Chavez? I know nothing about this. but So we're watching, and he comes up in a pinch-hitting situation. And what did he hit? He hits a double. Like, I'm watching his demeanor. I'm watching his, like, is he, is he shaking? You know what I mean? Like, like, I'm looking at the whole thing, you know? And he just gets up there, and he hits a double. And I'm like, that's got to be the greatest feeling in the world where you like actually come through, right? Because in a sense, it doesn't even matter what he did. It's like he's standing in the game. He's in the batter's box and he's going to take a swing, right? And it's like, it, I look at God watching us. He's looking at Elisha in this moment. It's like, what are you going to do, Elisha? Because you're, you're in the batter's box, buddy. And, and here are the leaders coming to you. And all of a sudden, you've got a decision to make. How are you going to swing the bat? And it's like so fun and exciting to read the scriptures in this way where you kind of put yourself into it. And it says, <laughs> so he's got this huge problem with the water. And look what he says. Elisha says, like, can you imagine, like, think about all the ideas that you would come up with. Would this be one of them? <laughs> what does he say? Bring me a new bowl. <laughs> I got your back. <laughs> like, think about this. Like, the leaders are going, oh boy, we just, this guy is a loser. Like, this, who, we, where's Elijah? We need Elijah. This guy wants us to go get a new bowl. Right? Think about that. Like, we, 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 we keep reading, stop. Stop reading, put yourself in the story and say, yo, what? And think about the reaction because Elijah has no idea how this is going to go. And I'm like, where did he get this from? Like maybe God whispered, I don't know, but it seems like the stupidest idea ever to me. Right? We've got a huge water issue. Mark, could you get me a bowl? And, and while you're there, could you add some salt to it? Like what? This makes no sense. Now, <laughs> so I'm thinking about Elisha. He speaks boldly. Right? So I got, you got to love that. Like he's swinging the bat. He's taking a shot, right? But, but we don't know what happens. We don't know the outcome. He leaves, <laughs> which is like, I would too. This is the dumbest idea ever. <laughs> like, here's your bowl of salt. I'm throwing it in. See you later, fellas. I hope it works out for you. Right? Like, just think about that. Oh my gosh, I love it. So I was thinking about the naysayers in our life. So listen to this. It says in verse 23, Elisha left Jericho and he went up to Bethel. So he's out of there. Now as he's walking along the road, a group of boys from the town began mocking and making fun of him. The naysayers. It's almost like they're saying, that. Like think about what you just did, Elisha. No wonder why you're tucking tail and leaving. Because there's no way that's going to work. Who do you think you are? And they start yelling at him, Go away, Baldy! 
right? And they're just jeering him. And I'm like, all right, maybe he's bald, right? That's the only thing I could think of. Like, this guy has no hair, he's bald, and they're picking on him, right? This is so absurd of a scene. But think about your life. Jeremiah, I'm going to reference uh, what happened to you a little bit without going into great detail. So, uh, Jeremiah, is, he's, he's in this right now. He's in transformation mode, right? Struggling with alcoholism. Now he's, he's sober. He's taking one day at a time, right? One foot in front of the other. And what's happening at Amos' house? What are they saying? The naysayers, the critics, right? The voices, the voices, and they're yelling, and they're yelling, and they're yelling. What's he say? Go away, Baldy. It doesn't sound like that, right? But it's like, who do you think you are, Jeremiah? Who do you think you are, Lori? Who do you think you are, Chuck? You can't possibly do this. Go away, Baldy. The voices from people, and now it gets worse. These, these are strangers that you're with. What about when it's your own family? The people in your household, the people that love you the most, and you want to make a change. Anyone here, don't raise your hand, but anyone here say, you know what? I want to get healthy. I want to lose some weight. And I'm going to change how I eat. And all of a sudden, it's like in your household, <laughs> they're like they're eating ice cream every night in front of you. Like, thanks. This is awesome. Thanks for helping me out here. You know what I mean? Like, even in your own home, they got the resistance. Like, seriously, you're still doing this? It's been a month. Can't you just, like, can't we get back to eating right? <laughs> you know, like, or eat, eating in a different way. I was like, this, this happens, right? So, so Diane and I, just to keep it very real, uh, you know, one of the things, that I'll be vulnerable here in front of you, is like I tell you, I've been doing this thing at Landmark, right? It's about transformation. And I'm super excited about it. I mean, if you know my personality, it's like 100 miles an hour, and Diane's like, you know, she keeps like, where is he going? Like, this is, he is going way out in front of me here. And it's like, Sean, you know, hello, I'm over here, right? And, and yet, we have these conversations. There's like these little one-liners that she throws at me. And it's like, it makes me go, uh, I don't want to go tonight, you know? Like, it makes me feel like a complete idiot because I don't want to leave her, right? Because I know that's important to her. But then I'm like, then I'm in the car and I got the voices going, and I'm like, Oh man, am I making the right decision? Should I not be going? Blah, blah, blah. And all this internal stuff is happening. So, and I'm not calling her a naysayer, but in a sense, you know. So, uh, <laughs> you get it, right? Yeah, you got to keep it real, right? So then what happens is, I want you to see, naysayers, critics, all of a sudden that leads to our voices. And I do say that very seriously because we have to watch our words. We can hurt people and stop people right when they're about to realize transformation and not even know it. And our own insecurity can get in the way of that. Or, so, so here's another one. Oh, this is, maybe you'll laugh, maybe not. I'm not picking on Diane time. All right. So, Diane and I, um, so at home, I decided to um, I wanted transformation in, in all areas of my life. And so I was like, you know what? I wanted to start eating, eating more healthy. Okay? So it's not about losing weight for me, but it was about what I'm putting into my body and really trying to eat healthy. So um, this, this girl, Joelle, who I met through Landmark, and I'm like her guinea pig because she's trying to get certified in nutrition and this sort of stuff. So I'm like, sure, I'd love to do that. So we went through this whole thing, and she's, she's adding new foods. That's all. So she's like, I love her thought process because like, I'm not going to quit eating this, this, and this, you know, but I'll add certain things in. So I'm adding these, these things in and making some small changes. And I'm a person who needs affirmation, okay? So I thrive in affirmation. So who do I want affirmation from? I want it from my wife, right? So, so one night, I, you know, we're, we're in a, this isn't going to get graphic, but I'm in my bedroom with her and I have my shirt off and I'm like, hey, honey, like, 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 honey, like, and she's like, you know, hon, I can't really like compliment you right now because <laughs> she's, she's not where she's at, where she wants to be. She has a goal too, right? And she's, she's been doing these great things and she's, um, 
you know, accomplishing the things that she wants, but she wasn't quite there yet <laughs> to be able to feel really good for me. <laughs> And so we had a little fun and banter with it, but I was laughing. I'm like, no, no, really? <laughs> right? So it's, it's just fascinating how we work, right? Just think about that. Like sometimes the people in your life, and, and this, is, um, this is not specific to us now, I'm just saying generally speaking, there could be like a lack of security, a la- maybe jealousy. Uh, you don't know why people pull you down, but Jeremiah, what I was thinking about you is like, right? You are stepping up and trying to do something huge in your life. And then you got all the people, like, it's like they're, if you're like trying to climb up, they're pulling, they're hanging on your ankles, right? And, and that comes in all forms. That's what I'm trying to get at. You don't even know how all these forms come, but it's like you're trying to make transmission. There's resistance. There's people pulling on you. So if you want to have transformation, this is why God's grace is so important. But you got to keep taking that step. you got to drag those suckers along. You, you drag them along. But I'm up to something, and I'm moving because I'm trusting God in this area of my life, come what may. Right? We want to realize transformation. So what is it in your life that's holding you back? That was my question. Like, anyone ever try to eat healthy and many of the other people who love you the most make you feel the worse or they say things or they keep eating all the unhealthy food in front of you? I mean, there's a huge conversation we can have around that, right? I just want you to see, first of all, if that is you, you can take responsibility for that and in, in Kind of get them involved in this in a healthy dialogue, in a healthy way. Come up with something that you can work in together. But understand that your life is your life before God. When you want to transform something, and as long as you have that picture and that vision, right? Like if you're an angry person or you're a stressed out person, and you need, you need change. Go after it. Don't let anything get in the way of that. So there's another scripture, 2 Kings 2, 15-18. I think this this story has both resistance, naysayers, and our own voices built into it. And it says this, the company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching. So these people, think about this, were supposed to be his teammates. Right? These are the company of the prophets. And they say this, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. So they saw this. They saw something happen. And they went to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. Look, they said, we, your servants, have 50 able men. Let them go and look for your master. Because all of a sudden, Elijah's gone, right? They don't know what happened to him. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some other mountain in some valley. Remember, this is absurd. It's never happened before. So maybe he's just somewhere else. We'll go look for him. And Elijah says, no, do not send them. So this is where he's standing. All right? This is what he decided. But they persisted. His teammates, fellow prophets, fellow people in the game of life with them. They persisted until... He was too embarrassed to refuse. Hmm. Too embarrassed to refuse. But they kept urging him. This is another translation. But they kept urging him until they shamed him into agreeing. Shamed him into agreeing. I want you to put yourself again. Stop where the the Scriptures go. Just stop there. And ask yourself, when have you been so embarrassed and it stopped you from realizing your transformation? His transformation was about leadership. His transformation was about taking on the mantle and being a voice for these people. 
And his leadership is being questioned and undermined. And now he's feeling embarrassed and shamed. Tie that on. Where in your life has that happened? And you kind of give in. Two thoughts about that. One is, like, first of all, it's just real life. It happens. It's like, now what do you do with it? It's okay when that happens, right? You're not, we're not always going to get it right. But it's like, okay, now I felt that way. Is my transformation no longer real? Am I no longer called by God to be the leader that He called me to be? Just because I gave in this one time? Just because I was embarrassed and shamed into making a decision that I didn't want to? No. It's just human. It's life. It happens. Get back up and still live within that. That's why that grace is so important. That clean slate is so important. So then continuing on, it says, so he said, right, he gives in. Go ahead, send them. And they sent 50 men who searched for three days, but did not find him. Now, I want you to think about this, and I'm asking you as a question, so if one of two of you can answer this. Pause there and say three days. Whenever this happens, I would actually encourage you to pause in the Scriptures and don't read on. And stop and ask yourself, what would you be doing in those three days? I just went back on my word. I wanted to make this decision as a leader before God. God spoke to me. I said this. But then all of a sudden, all the resistance came, and I gave in. I was so embarrassed. I was full, so full of shame that then I said, fine, go ahead, send them anyways. And then I got to live with that for the next three days. Pause. The question What's Elisha left with for those three days? Throw out some answers to me. Himself. And what? All the thoughts in his head. What were those thoughts like? Just thinking about that. Anyone popcorn answers? Give me, what were those thoughts going through his head? Why did I do this? Again, there's no right answers. Like, what else going through your head? What is it? I'll never be Elijah. They're always going to want him. I'm always playing second fiddle to him. I shouldn't have done that. What happened? Wow. That's <laughs> what happens if this dude shows up somewhere. <laughs> and then I'm done. What else? Someone else just said something over here? Self-doubt. Yes. Self-doubt. My gosh. A giant. Right? So this is for three days that this is happening. And he's left with all this stuff. Oh my gosh. Why did I cave? Why did I listen to them? What kind of leader am I? <laughs> and then it continues. And they sent 50 men who searched for three days, but did not find, but they did not find them. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said, that, said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? I kind of read that like, like the blame thing. That feels so disempowering to me. You, you see that? There hasn't, that transformation of getting back in the game hasn't happened yet. You see that? It's blame. I told you you shouldn't have done that. If you had just listened to me, that's not empowering. But this is where he's at. So, I wanted to tell you this. I'll, I'll close with this. I keep getting off the hook because I talk too long. I was like, I had a whole plan to bring someone up here and work with you on this. So, stay tuned next week. <laughs> um, but I do want you to hear this. It's like, this idea of integrity, and integrity, I don't want you to think of about good or bad. A lot of us do this, especially in Christian circles. We make integrity like, oh, we have to be people of integrity. And if I am, then I'm a good person. If I'm not, I'm a bad person. So take that off the equation. We just either honor our word or we don't. And this idea of integrity, I cannot keep my word 100% of the time, but I can honor my word 100% of the time. Will, show them the two pictures that are the before and after. Okay, <laughs> that's my side of the bed. So, don't, don't, don't go past that. <laughs> so that's like normal, just so you know. 
All right, Diane is a saint. Yes, you're all saying that. Say, she, she, let, let her preach next time and see what, oh boy, right? So I took this on as a way of cleaning the house and I was going to clean my side. Show the next one. This is my like little office space that I never use and you'll see why in a second. <laughs> I, I don't work there, okay? But that is my office space. And so I took a couple of hours and I started to clean it up. So Will, show the first picture. All right, now... <laughs> What do you guys think about that? What is it? What is it? Wait, 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 wait. What is it? Say it again, Kim. Yes, say it again, Kim. Much better. Yes, that's not what I got. I got, I got, I got. Honey, did you just kind of like push things underneath? Ah, come on. It's all in the perspective. What did you see? What, oh man, what did you say? It's all in the bag, yes. It's under the bed. No, just kidding. But, all right, show the next one, show the next one. All right, what do you think, what do you think? All right, all right, now look closely. Look at the, look at the keypad. You see that thing? That's got some serious dust all over, doesn't it? So. <laughs> oh boy, all right. So now, here's the point. Since then, since then, my little corner, every night, see, I'm a, I consider myself to be a very efficient person. So say I have my like sweatpants on and a t-shirt at night before I go to bed. So when I take them off, I leave them on the floor because it makes sense. I'm going to go to the gym first thing in the morning and I'm going to put the sweatpants back on, right? Makes sense. But then the jeans go there. Well, you saw what it was like. So you see, then it, so it's a slow fade, right? And so, literally at nighttime now, I'm like, and usually Diane's in bed before I am, so it's like I try not to like wake her up. And I'm like, I have the choice. Do I take my jeans and put them on the floor, or do I put them in my drawer? And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but integrity is honoring my word in every area of my life. And then when I slide here, okay, on something that's not even a big deal between me and Diane, some of you are like, we fight over that stuff every single month right? We don't. She's a saint. She lets me do this. It's craziness, but it works for us, right? But for some of you, you're arguing about that, and it's hurting your relationship, okay? But when I slide, and I put my pants down on the floor, instead of just putting them in the, in the bureau, I look at that and say, my gosh, where else am I going to slide? And I slide over here, because you know what I do? I literally take my phone, and I don't know if you guys do this, but I slide because I say, this thing that I'm supposed to do today at 2 o'clock, and now it's 3 o'clock, and I didn't do it, and I simply slide it to the next day. I'll get to it then. And then I slide that to the next day. It's a slow fade. So think about this. When you want to realize transformation, combine that with grace, combine that with your integrity, and honoring your word, and there's nothing wrong when you don't. It just says, guess what? Honey, sorry, last night I left my pants out. I'm going to recommit to doing that again tonight. Hey, Mark, sorry I was 10 minutes late today. I'm going to recommit to being on time. Like whatever those things are in my life where I'm sliding and you keep living within that transformation. Okay? I'm going over. Let me close in prayer. Lord, I just ask that these, these thoughts, these, these scriptures, these these ideas and principles that you're talking about, Lord. This is so important because all that we're talking about is making disciples. Transformation is at the heart of discipleship to help us become a little bit more like your son Jesus in all the different ways. And so, Lord, I pray that today, as people leave here, that they would wrestle with you in such a way that they'd be looking at these places where they maybe listen to the naysayers and that's taking them out. Or they're listening to the voices in their head and that's taking them out. Oh, Lord, they, they tried and then it didn't work out just right. Lord, bolster us up in your name. Bolster us up by your spirit to go and get it right today. This day, with a blank slate. Lord, by your grace, may we be conformed a little bit more to you. In Jesus' name, amen.